Teresa Richards. She'd been with us since the beginning. She helped us uh, start this church and get it going. And her and her family has been such a blessing. So we're grateful to have her share the word today. So let me pray for you. Lord, I just pray that you would bless Teresa, that you would speak through her, that she would have the words, Lord, that you want us to hear, that you would stir our hearts, that we'd be open to the message that she has for us, Lord, that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Thank you. Um, so it's great to be with you this morning. I'm glad to see so many faces, and welcome to the people online. Um, I love sharing the message. Only This is my only my, uh, the second time, but that's okay. I still love it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, if you, my name is Teresa. Uh, me and my husband, Matt, and my son, Oliver, they're actually ice fishing this morning. They came last night, so <laughs> I got my support then. But, um, yeah, we are just privileged to be a part of this church body and... Um, yeah, I just love Jesus. Um, he has, I grew up Mormon. If you don't know my story, I got to share about that back in the spring. I grew up Mormon, and um, I have now been a follower of the real Jesus for approximately 14 to 16 years. It was hard to tell um, just because it was such a journey coming out of that faith. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so we are continuing with our series of the gift of risk today, and so I've got a question for you all. Who in here has been skydiving before? Ooh, we got, oh, we have more than last night. <laughs> we had nobody last night, except David went, what, indoor. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, a building can only be so tall. I don't know. But... Um, so this is just an interesting tidbit about me that I thought kind of segued into our message pretty well. My first job when I was 14 was packing parachutes for the airport um, out here, you know, in Fremont County. And um, as I grew up, got older, I wasn't the only 14-year-old packing parachutes. And I got to thinking, you know, I am never ever going skydiving. Like, I am not going to put my hands in the, or my life in the hands of a 14-year-old. Um, I know that the girl who was working with me was more interested in the boys than in the parachutes, so I'm just saying, that's one risk I am not willing to take. <laughs> um, anyway, so that segues into our series of risk. And because it's the Christmas season, uh, we're going to look briefly at the story of Mary, um, and then we're just going to follow God's leading uh, farther. So uh, most people are somewhat familiar with her story, and I'm not going to read it to you or anything. If you want to look it up and read it for yourself, it's found in Luke chapter 1. And, um, you know, a lot of hundreds of thousands of sermons have been done on Mary and um, you know, you can look up all kinds of research. There's fascinating facts, fascinating tidbits. Um, but a lot of it is speculation. And we can speculate all over the place with her story. You know, what she was thinking, what she was feeling, what she was afraid of, um, you know, what it was like to get actual direction from an angel. Ooh. <laughs> um, like it's, you know, but it's all speculation. We don't actually know, um, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us what she was thinking or what she was feeling. But what I would like to show you is that Mary knew scripture, that she knew stories, that she knew the prophecies. You know, she was from the family line of King David. Uh, she was a descendant, direct descendant of him. And so, um, even the family history would come into uh, what she knew, and the Jews were looking for the Messiah. And so ultimately she said yes because of the word of God. Because of the word of God. So how do we know she knew the word? Well, let's take a look at the angel's message. What was the angel's message to her? And it's all about the Messiah. 
And, um, you know, I just picked out a few of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that go along with the, um, the angel's message. Tracy, you can go ahead and put up that first one. So the angel's message is over here on the, on the left. Sorry, this thing keeps falling off. <laughs> um, it's over here on the left, and it's basically saying, you know, a son is coming. You're going to call his name Jesus, which means he shall save. Um, and it points to his family line and the establishment of his kingdom. Okay? Uh, so Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. I won't read it again because Greg just read it this morning, and I'm saving time. <laughs> but it talks about a child is born, a son is given, right? It says what his name will be called. It talks about his government and his peace, his throne, his kingdom being established. And it is very parallel to what the angel's message is. Uh, the next scripture is Psalm 89, 27 through 29. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So again, talking about a firstborn son, um, the highest of the kings of the earth, uh, his um, kingdom endures forever, his throne lasts forever. Um, yeah, let's go on to the next scripture. Second Samuel 7, 12, 13, and 16. And this is uh, the Lord establishing his covenant with David. And he says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. I will be his father, he shall be my son. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And then I have one more scripture, Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So there are numerous other Old Testament prophecies that she could have all. Um, also had, you know, in her mind, in her heart already, and uh, she could have recognized. So this message really resonated with her, and she said yes because of the word of God. Um, you know, she recognized the message as matching what she knew of the Messiah, matching the word of God, and then she didn't stop there. She went directly to her cousin Elizabeth, who the angel had mentioned already, and she got confirmation right away that, oh yes, this was a messenger from God because what happened with Elizabeth is fulfilled. Elizabeth was barren and she was um, now pregnant in her sixth month. Um, then when, while she's talking with Elizabeth, we also see that scripture was in her. We see another piece of scripture that was in her because her response, uh, which is called her song, closely matches Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord, which was back in Samuel chapter one. And so I've got a chart of this one up here, um, and I won't read it all to you, but basically it, you can read for yourself the similarities between the two songs. And Hannah had been, um, you know, she wasn't anybody special to begin with. She was barren and she had been uh, pleading with the Lord. She went to the temple and pleaded with the Lord for a son or a child because people were taunting her. It was a disgrace to be barren. Um, and she had a real enemy <laughs> uh, taunting her. And um, anyway, she goes to the temple. Eli, the priest, sees her praying and says, receive um, from the Lord what you have requested of him. And she goes home in faith and conceives a son and she dedicates him to the Lord. This son later becomes, um, well, it's Samuel, it's her son, and he later becomes the prophet that anointed David as the king of Israel. So we can see from these that she knew scripture. Um, 
So I actually had really a hard time with this message initially because circumstances for us are, are really different. Um, we're never going to be asked to birth the Messiah. Um, there's never going to be another miraculous conception. There just isn't. <laughs> um, and, but then Mary was also very different from us. Mary did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit. I don't know if you realize it or not, but Mary lived under the old covenant still. Until Jesus died and rose again, the old covenant was in place, and she was under that. Uh, We also have the advantage of knowing the rest of the story. We saw, or we can read, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he did die for our sins, that he was resurrected, and Um, So we have the advantage, not only of the Holy Spirit living in us, but also of knowing the big picture, which hadn't been revealed yet. Um, So even though it's different in many ways, we are asked to carry the Messiah to the world, and we may be asked to birth other things like ministries or disciples. Now, usually it is small steps of obedience that have already paved the way. And that's where we don't know what Mary's um, childhood was like. We don't know, we don't have a glimpse of any of that, what other steps of obedience could have led to this decision to just say, yeah, here I am. I'm the maidservant of the Lord. Um, But when our hearts are already in a place of desiring to serve God, he can build on that. He will use anyone who is willing, regardless of how much they know or how spiritually mature they are or whether or not they feel ready. So what is God asking you to do? Is there something that you've been called to? And does it involve risk? There's an interesting thing about fear, um, and that's because it's all about self-preservation. It just keeps us looking inward, in towards ourselves. It keeps us in this bubble of ourselves so that we're missing what God is calling us to or what he wants us to do. Fear means that we're not looking at the word of God and we're not basing our obedience on that. We're just looking at you know, self-preservation. So I um, felt like I should put in this side note, and I'm going to try to keep it short because it could be a sermon all by itself. It's something I'm really passionate about. <laughs> but um, it's about renewing your mind. So renewing your mind to the Word of God is the only way that the Bible says we are to be transformed. It's the only way the Bible specifically says to be transformed. So we can say, yeah, I read my devotion today and I went to church this week. In fact, I did a devotion every day. Five minutes, five minutes a day. I'm renewing my mind. But then we're watching the news or we're on Facebook, scrolling through, you know, all kinds of junk (laughs) on there. Um, We might be Googling the latest political stuff or the latest health developments or whatever. Or we might even be watching shows to escape reality just for a while. I just need a break. Um, we might be actually getting together with people, but then all we're talking about is you know, the latest outbreak or <laughs> the, the latest restrictions or something. Those are things we're spending our time on, and, and then we wonder why we don't see transformation. But we're renewing our minds to whatever we give our minds to, whatever we spend the majority of our time on is what what we're going to see in our lives, honestly. And so when those things are outweighing the time with God and with renewing our minds, we're not gonna see the same kind of transformation. We just won't, we can't. Um, So anyway, that's the side note. (laughs) Um, I could go on forever, but. We're going to go back to missing things because of fear, okay? So maybe you've been called to missions, um, but you're not even considering it right now because of the potential difficulties, you know? It's hard to travel right now. 
there's so many restrictions and this country isn't even uh, open or, you know, the, well, the travel is just so complicated. But if God has called you, will he not make a way? Will he not make a way? Um, maybe it's something different like sponsoring a child, but you have uncertainty in your own job situation or your, your own security, and so you're, it just prevents you from taking that step. You're like, well, I can't rely on my income right now, so I can't make this commitment. These are all just the schemes of the enemy to keep us inactive. And um, that's the one thing we don't want to be is inactive in the kingdom. So I want to point you toward the joy that is set before us, okay? Um, it's the same joy that Jesus had when he was facing his hardest decis- decision in the garden, he was uh, about to go to the cross, right? In Hebrews 12, one through two, it says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and this is the people of faith who have gone before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know, the cross wasn't joyful. (laughs) It wasn't, but it was gonna be worth it. For the joy that um, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross for the joy that was to come. Jesus was the word, right? He was the word made flesh. So he knew the word in fullness, in its fullness. And, um, but he also had to have faith. So he said yes because of the word, but he had to act in faith just like the rest of us. Um, You know, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, did Jesus please God? So he must have had faith, right? He was acting in faith that all of the prophecies about him would be fulfilled, that his body, um, God wouldn't allow his body to see corruption. That was one of the joys set before him, that he would be raised and that he would bring, he would be the first of many sons to be brought into the kingdom. These are some of the, the joy focuses that Jesus had that he had to exercise faith in. And there were you know, numerous other prophecies that would also be fulfilled. So maybe you've been so distracted that you don't know what God is calling you to. There's been a lot going on lately, <laughs> right? Very distracting. Or maybe you're new to following Jesus um, and you just haven't heard his call on your life yet. So we're gonna look at that. Um, You know, what does Jesus ask of us? And I still forgot to get you paper (laughs) to write this down. So if you have some paper, um, go ahead and write something down. What What does Jesus ask of you? Or if you don't have paper, just, you know, think of something. So in Mark 12, 29 through 31, Jesus says, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So pretty much we get all kinds of direction from Jesus in scripture. It's throughout scripture. There's all kinds of things he tells us to do, but everything he tells us is an expansion on love or how to love. It's practical application. This is how you let this happen. Um, Let's take a couple scriptures and look at that. So John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Matthew 7, 12. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Luke 6, 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Luke 24, 47 says we are to preach repentance and the remission of sins to all nations. That's an act of love. Mark 16, 17 through 18 says to cast out demons and lay hands on the sick. Mark 11, 25 through 26 says we are to forgive. That's an act of love. Luke 6, 38 says give generously. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, make disciples and baptize and teach. These are ways of showing love to people. And then, uh, let's see, Matthew 20, 25 through 28 says, be a servant and serve people. John 14, 12 says, we are to do greater works than Jesus even. Greater works, greater love. So if you don't know where to start, I want you to think back to your thing you wrote down or thought of. (laughs) If you don't know where to start, ask if what you are doing right now is helping you to love God or to love others. Does it fall into one of these categories? Because if it does, you can't go wrong. If it doesn't, maybe you need to refocus. Um... But there's always that starting point that we are to be in action. Even if we don't hear a specific call, we can start there. Start with all of these, you know, this list of tasks. (laughs) And then maybe our specific call will come out of that obedience. So we're going to talk about some more risks you might take. Um, Some are called to foreign missions. You might be called to adopt or foster a child or just to sponsor a child. That can make a huge impact. Um, You might be called to change jobs. Sometimes our jobs are not helping us love others or love God more. They're hindering our progress in the kingdom. Um, You might be called into full or part-time ministry. You might be called to feed or work with the homeless, to plant a church. It might be street evangelism or healing, or it might be something like mentoring or tutoring someone, or prison ministry. Now these all, um, these all look like big risks, right? Some of them look a lot bigger than others. <laughs> um, but a lot of times, you know, we're looking at the risk and the cost and the fear And we're not looking at the reward. I want you to look at the joy. Look for the joy set before you and look at what the word of God says. So um, I've got a couple stories of some friends. I had asked them, what was one of the biggest risks you took that ended up being the most rewarding? And so there's quite a variety. Um, You know, one of my friends had a vision of herself Um, She had gone through a bunch of healing and and stuff. She had a vision of herself in a wedding dress in a field of flowers, and she felt like God was telling her she's supposed to go talk to this guy that she barely knew, and they're supposed to get married. What does she say? (laughs) Like, how do you approach that? It seems like kind of a big risk, but um, this thing keeps falling off. (laughs) Um, Anyway, Somehow, this happened. She actually approached this guy who she barely knew. They hadn't dated, hadn't hardly talked. And um, now it's been 10 years of marriage and they have four kids and things are going great and they're growing together in the kingdom. It was apparently meant to be. (laughs) So this is good. Um, Totally different note. I had another friend who was... um, Um, her parents were missionaries in foreign countries all over the place. And so at this one point, she was in Sudan, and uh, it was the rainy season. Now, if you don't know, in Sudan, the rainy season, all the venomous snakes and spiders um, come out, (laughs) and they're finding higher ground. 
And she felt like God was telling her to climb this hill behind their compound. She was like, what? You want me to do what? I do not want to go out there with all the snakes and spiders. Um, There are hundreds of people who die every year of snake bite in Sudan during the rainy season. And um, so she argued with him for a while, and then she went out in obedience. And she, she climbed the hill, uh, no spiders, no snakes, whatever. But she found a car at the top of the hill that had, it turned out this car had been stolen. And through the course of events, um, it led to nine people who had been held hostage being released because she was obedient in that one thing. She had no clue what reward lay at the end of that step of obedience. Um, I had another friend who talked about the small steps of obedience. She and her husband are now pastoring a church, and it was the small steps of of obedience that led to growth in leadership, that led to growth in strengths, in um, looking for God's ideas and not her own, and... um, now they've had their one year anniversary of pastoring this church and they're making a huge impact on their community. And, you know, following each of those tiny steps. Um, I had one more friend that she had been called to foreign missions from a young age. And again, it was those small steps of obedience that led up to her Uh, going out on the mission field. You know, she chose to not date anyone who didn't have the same call on their life. She chose, once she got married, to uh, rent instead of buy a home so that they could just get up and go and homeschool her kids. Same, Same idea, so we can just get up and go when we're called. And she ended up serving um, on missions both here in the States and in Um, a Muslim country, actually, for over a year. And now it's 15 years later, you know, she faced fears, fear after fear, she said, in the Muslim country. But now it's been uh, 15 years later, and she's still seeing fruit from it. She's still seeing prayers answered from that time. Um, So just taking those those steps of obedience. So we've been talking about some... um, quote unquote, big things. (laughs) But there are all kinds of things that we're called to and it, you know, depends on your season of life. Um, Just just lots of different things. But a couple of months ago, we had a guest speaker here, Chris Hicks, and he was talking about taking the next step, whatever that is, whether it's big or small or in between, uh, whether it is normal looking or crazy looking, which some of them, a lot of them are crazy looking. (laughs) But um, I went home, I was all fired up, I was ready for something really big. I was just excited. I was like, okay God, I'm done with the small stuff. Give me something big, I'm ready, I'm so ready. So I was journaling, asking God, and um, I got the names of two specific people that I felt like he said, you know, Go pursue these people because they need connection and direction. And I was like, that is not big enough. (laughs) Like, that's not important enough. I was asking for something big, you know? And and so I hesitated. And a couple days later, I, um, I was still asking for the bigger thing instead of going and doing my small task. And um, this is what he told me. (laughs) He says, focus on the tasks at hand. Do the tasks I've given you. They may not seem big and important, but you are serving me, the king. And he's the most important, right? You are trusted with people. So everything is important. And when you do, I will give you the next step. Okay, God, I will. <laughs> so I went and, um, you know, connected with these people, and it was, it was actually really a blessing. So um, anyway, it, it all goes back to what Jesus asks of us, you know, 
if it falls into any of these categories that I had listed earlier, you can't go wrong because it is love. It is love. Um, so, yeah, I've never really seen myself as much of a risk taker. I like to go the easy, cautious way. I like to analyze everything before I step out. <laughs> um, and probably by far, the biggest risk I've ever taken and the most rewarding was leaving the Mormon church and choosing to follow the real Jesus. And that has had lasting impact. Um, but I was looking at, you know, my life since then. What is like a pattern of risk that has kind of occurred in my own life? What, what has made the most impact or what's been the scariest for me? And um, a lot of my risks have involved hard but necessary conversations that have brought about life change. Um, you know, so one thing that I am continually, I'm still called to this, and I step out every now and then, <laughs> but uh, is having continued conversations with my family members about my faith, because I'm the only one following Jesus still. And so having those conversations, you know, it happens every now and then, and it's hard, um, but necessary. And um, yeah, just acting in faith that every seed that's planted will eventually grow. <laughs> um, another story I have is about five or six years ago, there um, I had a good friend. I had been going through a basically journey of freedom from an e eating disorder, and um, I felt led to you know, share my journey and this story and kind of my progress with this girl I barely knew um, at that point. And I was like, God, this is too personal. <laughs> it's too shameful. I'm so ashamed of this. And, um, you know, this is, this is just scary. I barely know her. And yet, you know, eventually I said yes, and it led to her freedom from bulimia. And she has been free ever since. Um, you know, nobody had known, not even her husband. She had never told a soul. And because I was able to open up, she has experienced freedom. It's life-changing, life-changing conversations. Um, one more is many of you know my husband, Matt, and he had had a problem with pornography for a while. And... Um, and of course I didn't know about it, <laughs> but um, because I made a confession of my own that, you know, I was attracted to this guy, he had displayed interest, and I felt guilty keeping it a secret. Because I made this confession my, on my own, he then felt free to make a confession to me. And now he's been free from pornography ever since. Life changing, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so some of these things are just, they can take so many, um, they can look so many different ways. They can take so many forms. We are enabled to approach and accept risk when we look for the joy set before us and to the word of God because it changes our whole perspective. It tells us what's important. It puts those things in line with what it should be. Psalm 16, eight through nine says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Hebrews 3, six, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. Rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. And Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So uh, worship team can go ahead and come on up. Um, there is another group of people I'd like to address before I finish. And um, there may be some people here or watching online that 
feel like you're taking risks, that you've been taking risk after risk, that you're fighting battle after battle, and you're just getting tired. You feel alone. Like, where is everybody else? <laughs> I am doing all the work. Um, but I just want to encourage you. Uh, Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Second Thessalonians 3.13 says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And then Matthew 11.29 through 30, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So don't try to force things to happen. If that's you, don't try to force things to happen. Rest in him, do your part, and then entrust it to God. Because you're not alone. We are never alone. He lives in us. He is a part of us. He doesn't come and go like with Mary. <laughs> you know, she didn't have the, the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. She had to be baptized just like everybody else. Um, so look for the joy that's set before you and hold fast the rejoicing of the hope. And the last thing before I finish. <laughs> this is um, an interpretation of tongues that I received back in January. And I just felt like I should share it with you, speak it over you. So you can just close your eyes receive um, and this is God speaking take courage I will not do anything against your will I cannot but my eager desire is to bring you into the image of my dear son Jesus you won't regret it calm the doubts and fears that are unfounded I am completely trustworthy those hard places in your heart do not need to remain that way. All it takes is one choice, the choice to soften them to my voice and to my touch. Let me demolish the walls you've constructed. Let me flow through you and let me bring life to all those places. My plan is not to harm you, it is to prosper you. And my plans always work. Some walls are already coming down. Trust me. So I just want to encourage you to take those small steps or big steps of obedience, of whatever you, you feel that God is calling you to. And if you're not sure of that, um, as we go into this first worship song, let's just pray. And we're going to ask God for what your next step step is what our next step is and it might be something small might be something big it might be something that you have to pray about more than just today <laughs> uh, you might not get an answer immediately but you might so let's just pray um, and then you can write that down uh, wherever you took notes or you can you know write it down when you get home um, Lord we just thank you we thank you that you have a plan for each one of us. We thank you that you have made all things possible, that all things are possible with you, God. We just thank you for the relationship that you've drawn us into, that we are called sons and daughters, that we are children of the King. And we just thank you for the privilege to serve you, God. We lift your name high here. And Lord, now we just ask, what would you have us do? What is our next step? We don't have to see the whole journey, but just the next step, God. Will you point each one of us to what you have for us? We just thank you. Welcome to stand and worship, whatever you feel led to do.